All right, so good morning all, and um, good to have you here this morning to study with us. Hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, hope you had a good time with your family, friends, and food. And uh, food was good, fellowship was good, we had a good time. A lot to be thankful for, and uh, we do give God all the thanks. Uh, if you will, this morning, turn to the book of Acts in chapter 17. Over the last couple of months, we've done some uh, teachings on uh, the mystery, grace, righteousness, justification. It's kind of like a build-up almost, if you will, but not intentionally. Uh, just studying and bringing stuff to the table that I think we, we should be growing on. And to grow on it, you need it. You need to hear it. You need to believe it. You need to study it. And we know that it's stuff that uh, we've heard differently in other circles, and that's okay. They teach what they teach. We're going to teach what we teach. And so this morning, I want to look at, if you will, I don't know what to title this right now, but I'm just going to say um, the judgment of God for right now. It'll be titled probably different than that when it gets to YouTube later on today in its recording. But we want to look at judgment uh, because there's a, there's a teaching in judgment for us today that's very important. We are not going to go look at all the judgments in, in the Bible because there's multiple judgments in the Bible. We're going to look at a very important judgment today that I want you to see clearly. Uh, so if you will, go with me to Acts 17. Go down to 24. And we'll begin our reading. God that made the world and all things therein seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Right away, that tells you this is not the house of God that we're sitting in this morning. We did not come to the house of God. Amen? The house of God came together this morning. We are the house of God. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he need anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath, and all things, and have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And there tells you there there's no place for racism. It's all one blood. Doesn't matter what color we are, to the pigment of our skin, we're all one blood. And what we've learned by that is that we're all sinners. And we're all in need of a Savior, regardless of what color your skin is. Amen? That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we also are also His offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he have appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom he have ordained, whereof he have given him assurance unto all men, and that he have raised him from the dead. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we're so thankful for this day, another day of your grace, your mercy, your long suffering upon all men. And we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the King James Bible. We thank you for the Spirit of God. And we thank you for your Son who went to a cross, shed his blood, died, and was buried, and rose again the third day for our justification. We'll give you praise, honor, and glory, and to you only. And everybody said, Amen. So look back at 31. Because he have appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he have ordained, whereof he have given assurance to all men, in that he has raised him from the dead. Look over in Romans in chapter 2. Verse 
in Romans chapter 2. <clears throat> Romans 1, 2, and a portion of 3, you've got to be careful with. There's a lot of men that preach Romans 1, 2, and a portion of 3, and they try to build a works-based salvation out of it. What Paul was doing in chapters 1 and 2, he's dealing with how Israel had the truth of God. They didn't retain him in their knowledge. Therefore, if they held back the truth and unrighteousness, that the world might know God through that nation that could have been that light on a hill, a city up on a hill, a light unto the Gentiles. And so he's using this to show how that eventually in chapter 3, he's going to move them away from the law to show them God's righteousness now without the law. And that's really what the book of Romans is about. It's about faith, and it's about faith in what God has given us to put our faith in, right? And that justification, righteousness, it's all, and grace, it's all a gift. That's why Paul says toward the end of Romans, mark them which cause division. Those who don't hold to this doctrine of it being all by grace through faith, and it's all righteousness of Christ, faith of Christ, need to mark them. Don't. People say, we got to respect all religions. No, I respect your ability to do whatever you want to do, but I don't respect your religion. The Bible tells me not to. It tells me to withdraw myself from it. It tells me to mark and avoid. So you got to be careful with chapters 1 and 2. Now we'll see that it does pertain to all men because in chapter 3 we see that all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. So look here, and we're going to talk about this judgment of God because I, I think once you understand this, assurance comes with it. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth, against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and does the same thing, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance of long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impotent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Notice the judgment there. When Paul, by the Spirit of God, inspired to write this chapter 2, when he says, Thou judgest those that do it, and you do it the same thing, Paul's not just talking about looking at a lens of people doing bad things and saying, That's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. What Paul's referring to, that all men are sinners there, and just as maybe Randy does something that I see that's wrong, guess what? I'm of the same common lump. I may not do the wrong that Randy does, the way Randy does, but Randy may not do the wrong that I do and the way that I do it. So he really is lumping them all up into one box, and we'll show this as we go. So the idea, and what I want to show you, is that righteous judgment of God. Look at 2.16 of Romans. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. See that? So the, the apostle writes, it's the righteous judgment of God. Right? It's the righteous judgment of God which God's going to judge by. You know we talked about the flood this morning. You know God wasn't unrighteous in bringing up the destruction up on, on earth by a flood. He was right. God's always right. God can't do unrighteousness. God can't lie. God is God. He's perfect. Right? So when he says there that he is going to judge the secrets of men according to his gospel, he calls it a righteous judgment. Look back at 1, 16 and 17. Watch this righteous judgment. 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Watch verse 17. For therein, in that gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You see that? 
So, according to righteous judgment, how is God going to judge? According to Paul's gospel. What does that gospel show you? The righteousness of God. You understand? So let me say this. God Almighty, back here, you being way out here, and we showed this similar last week, you being way out here, 2,000 years later, set over judgment in His Son, and He poured out His wrath upon Him for you. He judged Christ in your stead. Right? God Almighty, we talked about it this morning. Like I say, this is like Legos, man. We're building blocks. There was a man back here, and his name was Adam. And the Bible declares that sin entered the world through that man. When God took Christ to the cross and put him on the cross, he took him in the form of sinful flesh. He took Adam to that cross. God did not have to take four trillion people to the cross with him. How did sin get into the world? By one man. What did he do? He took one man to the cross and he crucified sin in the flesh. He crucified Adam. Amen. That's how Paul could say, I'm crucified with Christ, right? Because Paul was a descendant of Adam. Paul had sin in his flesh just like you got sin in your flesh. Just like you have that sin nature still with you because you're still in the body of Adam. And I know that because it's corrupt and it's going back to the earth. So God Almighty judged His Son in your place. Turned His back because He could not look at Adam on that cross. Turned His back. Christ said, My God, my God, why am thou forsaken me? It's because He became sin for you. You see that judgment? Well, let me ask you this. If you reject this, is God righteous in condemning you? Yes. If you reject God's program for salvation and justification, is He going to be just one day in rejecting you? Yes. Amen. Well, I don't believe God would send anybody to hell. I don't either. He gives you a choice. Amen. Amen. Yes. He's done all He's going to do for your sin debt. He's done all He's going to do by putting away the sin of Adam that entered into the world through that one man. He's done all He's going to do. And you're either going to receive it by faith or you're going to reject it and thinking you can get to God some other way. We just heard one say the other day, I'm going to start giving more money and doing more good things so I can get to heaven. You know the quickest way to hell is to believe that you can do something to get to heaven. All you can do is believe. So God, even though back here on this cross, He looked over here. And I want you to see this too. Because He saw a judgment. He put a judgment upon His Son for your sin. And for your sins. And all He's asking you to do is believe in what He has done. This is on God's terms, by the way. This ain't on the terms of some system out there. It's not on some terms of a denominational preacher or pastor or some group of people who have made them up a religion. This is on God's terms. God put the sin of the world upon Jesus Christ, judged Him in your stead. He was sacrificial. He was substitutionary. You either believe that, trust Him and Him alone, or you'll die and go to hell. That's harsh. No, that's facts. That's what the Bible teaches. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the, Je on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. What do I believe? I believe how that He died for my sins, was buried, and He rose again the third day for my justification. This judgment that God passed upon Jesus Christ for your sin and for you or me to think that we can do one thing about our sins to get God to say, Oh, yeah, that's forgivable. Donnie, just come and pray before me. That's pretty sick, isn't it? He's been judged. He was judged. The righteous judgment of God. The righteousness of God is in that cross and what Jesus Christ did. Now, you know what? If Jesus Christ has been judged for your sin, guess what that does for you? You're not going to be judged for your sin. Right? He can't do double jeopardy and say, well, you know what? Uh, Christ died over here for your sin, but you sinned over here, so now I'm going to pass judgment upon you for your sin. No, no, no. He can't do that. He, can't, he wouldn't do that. Why would God take His Son, put Him on a cross, shed His blood, He dies, 
He's buried and He's risen again and say, you can do something else to come to Me. No. Before the cross, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man can come to the Father but by Me. If you're going to heaven, you're going on the merits of Jesus Christ. You're going on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're going on the justification of Jesus Christ. And you're going to the faith of Jesus Christ. Or else you're going to stand at a judgment. And you're going to bow before the Lord. And your tongue will confess that He is God. He is the Lord. Amen? So you've got a choice to make. And I hope that the people who are listening to my voice that would watch this video would understand. There's many people out there I know. They're trying to get assurance of their salvation. They want to know that they're saved. They want to know that they're going to heaven. They are sincere about their salvation. But you know what's happened? Somebody came along with a Bible under their arm telling him, if you don't stop sinning, there's no way you can go to heaven. Show me somebody that you know, saved or lost, that quit sinning. You don't know one. Heard a lady once say one time, I've never sinned again since I got saved. Well, you just sinned. You just told the biggest lie you ever told. Right? So they take this Bible and they tell you, you've got to be willing to stop something, start something, commit something. I'm going to say something this morning and make the woods mad at me. You're not going to go to heaven on your love for God. God's love made a way for you to go to heaven. And he did it in the person of Jesus Christ. He judged his own son. Go to Isaiah 53. And I know who this pertains to, but I'm going to show you something. Well, Donnie, every week, all I hear from you is how to go to heaven. Well, the other churches, all you hear is how to go to hell. So you ought to be clapping your hands. <laughs> Right? Yeah. 53 starting at verse 1. I know this is written to Israel. I'm going to show you a point out of this. Isaiah 53 verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it was our faces from him. He was despised and he was esteemed not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord, watch close, have laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is speaking about Israel, right? Here's why I'll show you that it's spoken to Israel about them. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers, he is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. What were you not in Isaiah 53? You were not his people. So the mystery, I believe, when Paul talks about the mystery of the gospel, if you will, look at 1 Corinthians and 15. Hold your finger there in Isaiah. Chapter 15, 1 Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, starting at verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, 
how that Christ died for our sins. See that? Isaiah said he was cut off for his people. His people being Israel in Isaiah 53, right? But Paul says he died for our sins. So we could go back to Isaiah now with the revelation of the mystery that Paul was given and the gospel that Paul was given and say he has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jew and Gentile. Amen? Well, that mystery of the Gentiles having a gospel without Israel did not exist before Paul. Nobody preached Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again to the entire world without distinction to have justification of life until Paul. Now, you can argue that, fight that, and, re and refute that, but you're not going to win. Right? I, I was thinking about it yesterday, and I actually made a note of this. Why are people so offended when you say that Jesus Christ did everything and left us to do nothing but believe for justification of life? Why are they so offended? You know why? Because they have to have some good deeds. They have to put their flesh in it. They have to build up so that I can feel like I had something to do with it. That's why when you question people about whether or not they're saved and you say, what did you do to get saved? Well, I walked down an aisle one night. I prayed through to God. I felt like a new man. I went outside and the sky was bluer and the sun was shining brighter and a blue jay was sitting on top of a fence post singing Amazing Grace. I, I, I. That's not the gospel. The gospel is he, he, he. Amen. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. Amen. Are you with me? You understand this whole thing about judgment here? God, before the world was, and I'm going to show you this, before Adam fell, God, back here, before the world was, he made a promise of eternal life. Eternal. You know what eternal means? There's no end to it. You ever heard somebody say, I've got eternal life, but I can lose it? Really? How can you have eternal life and lose it? That's an oxymoron. That's crazy. No, you might have gotten life. You might have gotten probation from some preacher that said, if you do good long enough, I'll keep you out of jail. But you didn't get eternal life. Eternal life comes from one person. Eternal God. And once you have his life, it's eternal. You can't lose it. But this judgment that God saw and he put it on Jesus Christ <clears throat> to redeem both heaven and earth. And we're rejecting it because we've got to believe that we're doing something. Do you see how God's going to judge righteously? Right? Look over at, um, look over at Romans chapter 3. We'll move, we'll move on here to get this done on time. Romans chapter 3. I told you to be careful with the early part of Romans. It's a slippery slope there that guys try to build you into a spiritual Jew. Because they go with a circumcision of the heart. And what Paul is showing them is judgment is coming <clears throat> if they reject the righteousness of God. In chapter 10, what did he say? He said they, they, they had a desire for God, but not according to zeal, but not according to knowledge. Because they, they rejected God's righteousness to go out and establish their own righteousness. Well, that's what we do when we sit and say that that's not sufficient. This is everything, folks. It, you, look, men preach and teach for a legacy. You know that? I was telling my wife this morning, men, men want to write books, and I'm not against that. But men want to draw crowds. They want a legacy. So when they leave, everybody can sit back and go, Old Brother Don. Old bro if you don't remember anything about me, you just think about this cross right here. You think about Jesus Christ. I'm not doing this for me. I'm not doing this for a legacy. I could care less if you remember anything about me, period, after I'm gone. Just remember the teachings of the cross and Jesus Christ is everything and everybody else is nothing. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody and justify them freely by what he's already accomplished. Some people don't want to do that. They want to put their fingers in their ears. I get it. 
You're not hurting me when you put your fingers in your ears. I'm telling you about what saith the Word of God about your judgment. And Christ has already suffered your judgment for your sin. And you can either take it or leave it. It's up to you. Right? There may be a playback one day when you're in hell and you go, Oh my God, I remember hearing that message. I don't know. Maybe it'll be real. Maybe it won't that you're going to be there saying, I remember about that message. I recall somebody telling me that. I don't, I don't know. I know there's one in the Bible in the book of Luke who wanted Moses, the voice, right? And God said, no. Not happening now. Too late. Right? It'll be too late. When you don't receive what God did in judgment, he said over judgment of his own son. Do you get this? He, you, the simple person that we are, God so loved us that he said, I'll judge my son in order to save and justify you. The righteous judgment of God. Look here in chapter 3. Look up in verse 5. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, is God unrighteous? Who take a vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? Well, we already know he's going to judge the world through what? Righteousness. Right? He's going to judge all men during this dispensation of the grace of God by Paul's gospel, which reveals the righteousness of God. For if the truth of God have more abounded through my lie unto the glory, unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather as we be slanderously reported. And as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? <laughs> no, and no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under what? As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used to see. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. It's almost like reading today's news, isn't it? Yeah. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, now watch, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become what? Guilty. Hey, were you guilty? Yes. You were guilty. Sure Are you guilty of sinning right now? you guilty of sinning. Guess what? He's not charged you for it. They've heard people, you know, some people want judgment to come so bad on others. Well, I can't wait till God judges him for that. What did Paul just say? You think you any better than they are? He just put you in a box with all humanity and just said to judge them for what they're doing. Now do us the same things, right? Wouldn't it be just if God just judged you all? You know the teaching and preaching out there back when you had bad things to happen down in Louisiana with Katrina? You had certain bars blown up, certain things. Happened. That's the judgment of God. That's the judgment of God. Why wouldn't he start with you? Yeah. Right? You know why? I've been watching this series of apologetics. Anybody ever heard of apologetics? Apologetics is a man who stands and tries to prove God, right? He tries to take people who are atheists, agnostics, what, whatever, and they get in this big room, this big auditorium. The, van, the man is extremely, extremely smart in a lot of ways. But there's a question that he can never answer to one atheist or agnostic. And you know what that question is? If there be a God, how does he allow evil things to happen? 
You can't answer the question. Well, I can tell you why God allows evil things to happen. Because right here, God has said this is all by grace. It's a dispensation of grace. And you know what He's done? He's left you with your free will. He's left you with grace. He's not mad at you. He's not charging you with your sins. He don't hate you. He judged it back here at the cross. And God allows the evil to go on because you know what God would have to do to stop the evil? Kill us all. You know why? Because we're all evil. <laughs> well, I'm not evil. That just shows how evil you are. You don't realize what you are. Right? So if God suspends evil, which he's going to do over there when he comes back and rule in righteousness, guess what? The unrighteous are gone. That's how he brings in peace, folks. You, if you want evil to stop, you ought to stop and think about your own wicked heart. The Bible tells you that, right? The heart of man is evil, desperately wicked, and who can know it? And if you don't understand how vile you are in your sinful flesh, then you may absolutely be sitting here every, every week taking in the Word of God and be lost. I mean, you got to understand how bad off you are, man. It ain't like God put Jesus on the cross so you can get better and climb up to Him. God put Jesus on the cross because there was no way to get to Him because you are a sinner to the flesh. You need to be perfect. And you can't be. God judged him in your stead. God's going to continue judgments all the way out to the great white throne. Right? That's where the damned are going to show up, folks. In here, God has already judged your sin is what I want you to see. He's already passed judgment upon your sin. He just wants you to receive him. Now watch what all the way up to chapter or chapter 3, verse 20, all the way up from chapter 1 to 3 and 20, Paul is laying out the condemnation. He's laying out the rejection, not retaining God in their knowledge, how they're judging one another, yet they do the same things. That's all of us, by the way. You know, you see somebody out here that's in trouble, that, that's had a hard time, whatever the case may be, their decision making, maybe. You know what I think about when I see stuff like that? We're not for the grace of God, I could be that person. We're not for the grace of God, I'd be in hell today. We're not for the grace of God. You know, when you start to lift yourself up, to think you're better than somebody else, you need to take a check on your salvation. You need it. Let me, let me say this. Willie, I love you to death. And Willie, I believe, is a good man. I really do. I, I'd give him a $100 bill if he needed it. I'd give him a shirt off my back if he needed it. Probably wouldn't fit you, but I'd give it to you. He's like, I believe he's a good man. But that's me seeing Willie. That's me comparing Willie to other people. that I. That's not me saying Willie to Christ. If I put Willie up against Christ, what does Willie become? A sinner, right? A man in need of a Savior. A man that can't help himself. A man that's in the flesh, a sinner. I can't look at Willie and say, oh, that's how God can say, Willie, you're no good. Donnie, you're no good. No, not one. No, not one. He didn't say the preacher's good, the pastor's good. That's probably the most rotten guy in the whole building, right? He's talking about you have got to be compared to Jesus Christ. And then when you see that, what you see is we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, which is in His Son, Jesus Christ. You understand what we're saying about judgment? Now, let me ask you this. Do you want to stand one day before the Lord and say, look, Jesus, I... Oh, Willie, I know I'm a little better than he is. I want you to judge me based on me and Willie. Is that what you really want? You really want to stand and say, judge me on something good that I did. Judge me on something that I brought to the table. Judge me for going to the altar one night. Judge me for being water baptized. Judge me for joining a church. Judge me on how many times I went. Judge me on my Sunday school certificate. Judge me. Ju no, 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 you folks, I'm telling you, that will burn. That's not what you want. What you want to say is, Lord, oh Lord, I believed on your son Jesus Christ, how he took my place on the cross. He crucified Adam in the flesh. He crucified me in the flesh when he crucified Adam in the flesh because I was a descendant of Adam. I was on my way to hell. But one day I realized that you were right. I was wrong. I changed my mind. It's all about your righteousness, your wholeness, your justification. That's how you get saved. That's how you become justified. Just as you'd never sinned. 
God Almighty, you have a man in Christ that cannot sin. He's in Christ. He can't do wrong. He's in Christ. There's no adultery in Christ. There's no fornication in Christ. There's no denomination in Christ. Probably the biggest sin on earth is religion. You've heard me say it a million times over. It's corrupted and sent more people to hell than any honky-tonk on God's planet. I'm just telling you the truth about the matter. This judgment, folks, we ought to be thankful. All right, this morning, go over and look at Ephesians 3. This is why this verse is so important. It's a time of peace right here. I'm not talking about world peace. It's a time when God Almighty, because of this cross right here, He's at peace with the world. People have God up there in heaven just zapping people, zapping people. You say something against a preacher and he'll kill you. He probably would agree with you, right? <laughs> You're right. He ain't preaching the gospel. He ain't, you know. I'm just saying. It's a time of peace right here. This is called the dispensation of the grace of God. It's a time in which God has reconciled the world unto himself through the cross of Jesus Christ, not imputing our trespasses, right? He is not counting our sin against us. God Almighty is not mad at you. And listen to me. It doesn't matter what you've done, how many times you've done it. God Almighty is at peace. Now all He's asking you to do is be reconciled unto Him by believing what I just gave you right here for the gospel. Amen. That's all He's asking. Your faith in what His Son did. Your faith in what His Son did will glorify the Father. It will glorify the Son. And the Holy Spirit will lift both of them up so the world can see. Right? You know what I've heard just recently? If you preach or teach all grace, then people are going to get out and they're going to get in sin and they're going to do this, this, and that. I said I wasn't going to bring this to the assembly this morning, but I am a lot. So God don't hold it against me. I know he ain't. I've been watching a series of people in religion, occult religion, very dear to your hearts most likely, where men were law-abiding, bashing people for everything under the sun, and the corruption that was in that denomination and is still in that denomination is off the charts, man. Off the charts to what those people have received by trying to bind up the flesh on their own. Molestation of young girls, 12, 13, 14, 15 year old, grown men, deacons and pastors and assistant pastors. And if you teach all grace, they're going to go out and get drunk. And that black hearted devil up there preaching against people what their hair looks like, what their clothes look like. Oh, you want somebody to call it like it is? I mean, yeah. Well, I'm more worried about my crowd going to the roller dome and, you know, skating around in a circle listening to rock and roll music. And these sick men up here raping young girls and covering it up through the pastor and the channel of that assembly and their hierarchy, putting it to sleep by sending them off to another state to get away so they won't be reported and do it again. Well, you don't know if that's true. Yes, I do. I did my homework before I ever saw the show. The show just confirmed what I'd already learned. So teach them all grace and they'll become sinners. No, you're a sinner and you need grace. Did somebody, he, you know, a dog don't bark. He don't become a dog because he barks, right? Do you know why he barked? You know why you sin? You didn't become a sinner because you went out and stole something. You were a sinner, that's why you went out and stole it. You didn't commit adultery because that's going to make you a sinner. That was in your heart to do it because you were already a sinner. That's what Paul's saying in Romans chapter 2. And some people can't live with that because it opposes the flesh. You know why the message of grace is so offensive? Listen real close now, we're going to close. I'll tell you why. The flesh lusteth against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. You know what the spirit is saying? It's all by grace through faith. It's not of works lest any man should boast. You know what the flesh is saying? But, 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 he's pushing against this message of grace. 
That's why we can't get with 20 people together. Everybody else got to have a shiny building with a shiny pastor stealing from them every Sunday. Bring your money to me. All your heads bowed. All your eyes closed. Put your wallets on the table. Put your hands on the table. And when I see the money, I'll pass over you. Amen. Right? They showed this man having a birthday and the youth group took up $70,000 for him and put it in a wheelbarrow and rolled it up onto the stage. Is that flesh or not flesh? Dropping out of the roof on cables like rock stars. Well, that's what the spirit is doing, my back leg. The spirit ain't a million miles of that, man. And you cough at this grace message every time you hear it. You shoot down a man like E.C. Moore. You shoot down a man like Steve Atwood because he's telling you about grace. Best thing ever happened to you to hear one of those guys teach a message on God's grace. Right? And reject it, reject it, reject it. You know why? Because your flesh says, mm, I ain't taking that. It needs me. That's what your flesh does. Let us close. Father, we're so grateful and so thankful for this day, another day of grace. And I pray, God, that the message that uh, you've put forth by your grace is true to the heart of the people who will receive it and to those who reject it. I pray for them because the hardness of their hearts. And I pray, Lord, that they too might see their need for a Savior because of their condition as being a sinner, lost. And Lord, though we all to the flesh are sinners, you took sin to the cross and you nailed it there. You condemned it in the flesh. I trust you and you alone. I believe in you and you alone. I believe in the blood. I believe in the dead. I believe in the burial. I believe in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I have no need for anything that a man could do for me or I could do for myself. I trust Him and Him alone. I commit my salvation and justification to Him and Him alone. And there's only one way I could ever go to hell. And as if your, your truth is not truth, and I know better, I know it is truth. And everybody did say, Amen. Amen.